it's James. I'm an ex-teacher, um, and I now work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about PyCon UK, and in particular the education track that I attended um, last year. Just before I get started, can I, I'm, just, I, I'm imagining that the majority of the audience are developers. Is that the case? Are there any teachers or educators in the room? Awesome. So we've got some, we've got some educators. Awesome. So um, I want to talk a little bit about PyCon um, UK. And um, to do that, I'm, I'm going to just step back a little bit. And I'm gonna, I, I will be re-emphasizing a few points that Carrie Ann made in her keynote this morning. Um, but I want to just step back to how um, I began as, uh, as, as, uh, as a learner. So sometime in the 80s, and we'll, we'll keep that vague, um, I was uh, embarking upon my early education. Um, and my, my mum particularly was very good at, at supporting me with just exploring the world and finding out things. And she'd often come home and I'd have a theory uh, at four about how gravity worked. And it was wrong. Well, you know, she'd, she'd come home and I'd greet her with a theory. But I was, I was as kids are, I was um, keen to investigate. I liked playing with things. And so the things that f informed my early education were things like Lego. Um, which I played with for hours on end, followed the manuals. I don't think I had that set. I think I coveted that set. Mm -hmm. I think I had the smaller version. Um, about the age of eight, I think we got our first family computer. We got the cheaper version of the Commodore 64. This is the Atari 65XE. Technically, it was a family computer, but my siblings knew that really it was mine, and I made that very abundantly clear. Um, and I began, after playing some games, I started um, using BASIC and writing some very simple programs. And um, I was also really into craft. Anything, you know, glue, scissors, cardboard, I'd make anything. And I'll come back to this idea in, in just a second. But um, I also progressed from BASIC Lego, I progressed to Technic. And Technic I loved, and still love. You know, I got, I got Technic this year for my birthday. And that was the best present that I got, it was awesome. Um, <laughs> We've recently, our house has been packed up as if we're doing an extension. My Lego came out and I was amazed. Brilliant, there's my crane thing. But for me, the point with Lego was I didn't just learn about how to connect things. It, it, it taught me about mechanical systems. The first kit I got that had a differential gear in, I was like, this is amazing. Now I understand how a car works. Brilliant. And so I learned so many things from these. Again, that's a set I coveted and bought when I was 25. Um, so, so Lego really informed uh, my early years as well. Uh, knitting was something that my mum taught me quite early on. I lost the skill and I've recently almost picked it back up again. I was on a recent trip and I took some knitting with me. Um, and I, as well as um, starting out with some basic programming, I, I picked up some of the Osborne books, which were fantastic. And I specifically remember this book and um, a battleship style game that I, I, I built. And the point I want to make about these education experiences, these were you know, before school or, or, um, or sort of on top of the stuff I was doing at school, is that all of them were playful. All of them I approached in a playful manner. Okay? And every single one of them I could put down at any moment. I could make something in Lego and go, ah, don't like that, I'll throw it away. Okay? And this kind of comes back, when we were talking about IDEs during the keynote, um, one of the things that I, I, I sort of, really wanted to bring up at that point was that when you've got to use an IDE and you've got to make a project, you're kind of you're committing to making a project. Whereas if you've got this nice sort of boilerplate, scratch pad style area, you're playing. You can play as kids do and then just chuck it away. Okay? The other thing about these learning experiences was there was purpose. There was something that I wanted to get out, something that meant something to me. It wasn't someone telling me to do something. I wanted to build that airport. I wanted to knit something. I wanted to build the technical thing, and I wanted my game to work, and was frustrated when it didn't. And the final thing was, was that there was progression. There was always somewhere for me to go next. So I started out with Print Hello World, and I exhausted all the examples in the Atari manual that came with it. But then I found somewhere else to go. Lego, there's just, there's just so many places you can take that, and there's so many crafts out there. There was always somewhere new to go. So those three things, playfulness, progression, and purpose is something that I think is really important in educational experiences. Um, and there's a middle section to my life where I went to university, did computer science, lots of interesting anecdotes involving me mainly losing stuff. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm a reformed parent. Um, but then this was, um, this was me as an educator. So I've moved on from being a learner. And, and in 2004, I started um, a career in teaching. So I started uh, my time as a math teacher. And, um, 
as someone who could use a computer, and there was an outgoing head of ICT, picked up this role um, and, and really enjoyed doing it. Um, it was a great experience. But I did get quite quickly frustrated with ICT, and this again echoes some of the points that Carrie Ann was making earlier. A lot of ICT was being driven by office app based programming, was limited to Excel, macros, and formula. And a lot of the engaging and difficult, also what I would des des describe as engaging, and what a lot of teachers might consider difficult concepts or activities, were left to the end of the year. A lot of primary school teachers that I was sort of talking to around the time was, oh yeah, yeah, we do Lego robotics and we program them in like the summer term. Sometimes we don't get the full six weeks that we allot, sometimes we do a week. Because it was those, those things they'd leave to the end as the fun mm -hmm. activity to end the year, and then at the end of the year, oh, it fell off the end of the year, never mind, we'll do it next year. And those kind of experiences were always being left to the end. So as I started, I, I was um, sort of kind, of kind of really trying to change the way that I was doing things in school. I managed to convince the school to buy some Lego robotics. We started a Lego club. We entered the first Lego league. Um, Games Factory. Has anyone ever used Games Factory? It doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but that's where I started. Um, I remember hanging out in a shop in my local town called Microfuture, where they had this system called Click and Play. And it was a drag and drop games engine. You put a sprite in, you pressed a button, and it pinged around and bounced off walls. And that was you know, a starting point. And they, they, they developed it into, a, into an education product. And I used that in school. It was really good. Um, Scratch, again, uh, lots of Scratch stuff, simulating games, those kind of things. And we also um, tried to do some HTML. There was some HTML before. Sorry, I keep turning and the microphone keeps losing me. I'm a fidgeter. Um, so HTML was... Um, was something that the school had previously done through like uh, front page or, or Dreamweaver or something like that. And I think you start using those big heavy IDEs and you start losing the basics of how that works. That's not how I learned HTML. I learned HTML with a notepad in one window, a browser in another window, save, refresh, save, refresh, save, refresh. So we did some basic HTML stuff. Um, and I, I moved on, I went to a, a secondary school, but I began collaborating. And this is the point where I think uh, things changed a lot for me. Because those frustrations that I had in school, being the only teacher who kind of, in my mind, got it, um, was really difficult. So starting to connect with other teachers was really important. I joined CAS, which is a group in the UK called Computing at Schools. I started working with local primaries, helping them deliver robotics in their schools. And then, all of a sudden, um, in, it, was, it was a few years ago, um, it was possible to teach the GCSE in computer science. So there was a pilot phase, and there was a phase where um, teachers could pick it up. And I was super excited by this, because this was finally, you know, all these things that I've been banging on about were going to happen, and I could pick this up. And I was really excited. And then I suddenly realized, oh, well, actually, how am I going to deliver this? What's, what's my route to deliver this with kids? And, and the first question was, what language? And that sort of, again, like we mentioned earlier on in the keynote, this took me back to my... My, my childhood experience is using BASIC, and, and, and Python was really the clear choice for me. And there was this whole, so, oh, how do I teach this? How do I go about sharing this with kids? You know, I know how to write a loop or write a function or do this and that, but to me it seems self-evident. How do I break that down and take my understanding and put it, get it across to the kids? And how do I challenge kids? I had a kid in my um, first GCSE class who'd been programming since the age of five, and had never stopped. Unlike me, but when, when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet. Uh, we were very late getting the internet. Um, eventually, I convinced my dad to buy us a three-month trial of this internet thing. Uh, we got on there, and suddenly, uh, the, the, you know, my horizons were expanded. But he'd been learning Python for, for years, and C and Java, and he was, at, that, at the time he came to my classroom, he was a far better programmer than I think I will ever be. So how do I challenge kids like that that have this experience? Because there is, unlike traditional subjects, there is this, um, this difference of experience. Some kids will have been doing this for years and years and years and have a wealth of experience. It will just click. And other kids might be aware of it or might have been put off by it in the past. So whereas in other subjects you might have a fairly level playing field, you've got a whole different range of experiences. So... Um, the, the collaboration with other teachers was imperative, was really important, and it was around that time that um, I gave a talk at uh, Raspberry Jam. Um, I met Carrie Ann shortly afterwards, went to Pi Academy, joined Twitter, um, went to more CAS conferences and things, and 
that was the point at which I, got, uh, I, I became aware of PyCon UK and uh, submitted my application hurriedly because there was a deadline and if you quit, if you quit you'll get a free place and, uh, and, they'll, and they'll fund your uh, cover costs. So great, yeah, I'll do that. And so that's how I got to uh, PyCon UK. So PyCon UK was a fantastic experience for me. It was uh, last September um, and particularly the education track which is where I spent my day. Unfortunately, I had just moved house and so I had a wall to go and knock down or something at home so I could only stay for the Friday. Um, but there was a two-day track. The first day, the teacher's day, was, was brilliant. And I'll talk a bit more about how these worked in a moment. The second day was a kid's day. And developers were welcome to come to both of those two days, encouraged to come to both of those two days. In fact, there's a picture somewhere of Nick in a minute. I think it's the first picture I've got on here. Yeah, there's Nick saying, go to the education track. You should be there. Um, and so it was, it was fantastic. It was filled with workshops, demos, training, discussions, quadcopters towards the end of the day, and cake. Uh, which, you know, <laughs> which is going to get anyone there, really. And I'll, I'll, the, the cakes here, if they don't whet your appetite, nothing. They're amazing. Uh, we were joined by members of the uh, Rank of Five team. Um, so Dave is in the bottom right-hand corner. He's not with us today. He's the guy that Ben was previously talking about who is doing loads of space stuff. We've got Ben, we've got Carrie Ann, and we've got Alex, who's down here with us as well. Um, and uh, there's the cake. Yeah, so the cake was amazing. So one of our... Um, a teacher that I hadn't met at this point, um, but I was aware of from Twitter called Kat. She'd been on a, a following, uh, the, the Pi Academy after me, and we, we'd sort of been chatting a little bit on Twitter, and she was like, I'm going to bring cake. So she turned up with this cake, and it, it just vanished. I think I, I saw it at the beginning of the day, and then by the, like halfway through the day, I was like, where's that cake gone? And there was, there was one cake left. So it was a, it was a fantastic day. Oh, the, the link at the bottom, um, I've nicked a few things from uh, Nick Tolloway's excellent introduction to PyCon UK. If you want to um, have a more detailed overview of the two days, um, you can follow that link and that will take you there. Um, and we were also joined by members of the community. Um, I forgot to thank um, two people at the beginning of the presentation. This is um, Alan O'Donoghue, um, who, as, along with Nick, um, provided... A, some last minute, uh, a lot of the images that I've used in this presentation because I had some camera failure issues. So, um, yes, yeah, so loads, loads of community people that had given up their time to come along to talk about education, how we educate, um, and, 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 the, and the sort of the, the projects that we should be focusing on. So, this was sort of how the teacher's day was broken down. So, first of all, we can see we've had a session on Minecraft Pi, and we can see all the teachers worshipping Minecraft there. <laughs> or Martin, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so this guy you can see standing at the front there, this is Martin, he's got an excellent website, Stuff About Code, um, and that, that's, that's how he usually starts his workshop, with a, okay, please, you know, pay your respects, worship, that kind of thing. So, and, and he gave everyone a little demonstration of how to use uh, the Python library to interface with uh, Minecraft and create amazing things. And if you think back to that, the, the first point I made about my early experiences with Lego, um, Minecraft is often described as digital Lego, okay? This playground, this, this area where kids can play. And I, I don't see Minecraft, when we talk to teachers, I don't try and put Minecraft across as, oh, here's a game. Minecraft for me in education is a medium. It's a way of expressing things. The idea we talked about early on, the story about, oh, we want a, a game where we've got, you know, uh, it's set on a planet and there's aliens and you shoot them. Well, with things like 2D graphics Pi game, to get kids to make something graphical, I never bothered with my GCSE kids because it was just was the, 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 it was more of an A-level topic anyway, but for the amount of time they had to put in to get something simple graphical on the screen, it just, you know, Pi game just wasn't worth playing with at that time. Minecraft? We can build all sorts of things with Minecraft. So we set my kids in, in school a challenge. We said, go away and I want you to build Space Invader, and they went away and they did that, they built Space Invaders, but then they turned those into flashing Space Invaders, Space Invaders that chased you, Space Invaders that dropped things on your head, Space Invaders that chased you. They hid Space Invaders around the world, and you had to go and find them. So Minecraft is a medium, and this, this workshop was fantastic. And there were loads of people, um, it was their first experience of Minecraft, first experience of, of programming, and they loved that. Um, we then, there was a session we had um, all about physical computing, so some of the things that uh, Ben's just been talking about in his talk. There was a session, uh, flashing LEDs, using motors, um, we had some spinning flowers and bees, is that right? Yeah? Okay. I wasn't in that session, there was a, a bit of a split at that point, um, but th th there was some physical computing. 
Um, we also had uh, a session with an introduction for secondary teachers, particularly, to object orientation. For lots of those teachers, object orientation was something they might encounter with libraries that they're using, um, but wasn't something they were overly familiar with, or wasn't something that they had used for ever or for a long time. So it was a great introduction or refresher. Um, we also, we had a, a team brought over some, oh, it's gone too far. Oh dear. There's a robot there, it's going to disappear. Um, so the robot there, is a little, uh, it's called a now robot, and a team brought those over, they danced, they sang, they did all kinds of clever things, you could take them for walks, and they talked about their programming interface behind that and how schools should be doing more robotics. And then the afternoon session, we, we had a, an unconference style session. So we started off, we got all the teachers and developers together, we pitched some ideas, and then we all broke off into groups and we kind of worked together as teachers and developers to either do some resource development. So I want a resource that helps me teach this concept. Let's go and make it together, brilliant. Or perhaps some coaching. So there was a, a lady um, who um, wanted some help with, I think she was doing some web stuff and she wanted some help with Django, I, that rings a vague bell. Um, and so she sat down with a developer who helped her understand how Django works and write uh, the beginning or the framework for a scheme of work to take back with her kids. And there was uh, you know, people that were sort of talking about how to make some libraries or some tools. So this, um, this screen here, um, there's a thing for one of the GCSEs. They have to do a project on Little Man Computer. Are you guys aware of Little Man Computer? Okay, it's, it's kind of, I don't teach that spec, partly because I don't like Little Man Computer. Um, but I think it's basically, it's a simulator to help you teach kids um, um, machine code type, like, you know, like very low level code stuff. So very basic operations and instructions. And the complaint from one of the teachers was, at the moment, this doesn't run on the Raspberry Pi, and we're using them. So they sat down with some developers, and they ported it to the Raspberry Pi. Okay? And that was like an afternoon's work for a developer. So this, this bit, the second part of the day, was really, really valuable, because it gave the, gave the teachers the chance to direct the help, the support they needed. And I think this collaboration is really important. So if we think about the, the first group of people that are there, the teachers, okay? The teachers, they're really great at delivery, okay? They've got years of experience of doing that. They know how to take a concept, to break it down into parts, to work out how to deliver that, to explain that, to get that idea across. They're also great at that sort of idea of progression. So this is your starting point. We want to teach you this concept. What's the pathway that we're going to take to get there? They're great at assessing, knowing where kids are up to, and you know, sort of getting a really good measure of what kids understand, um, what they haven't grasped, and what their next steps are. And they're also good at engaging pupils. You know, it's, it's their job, it's part of what they do. But what they need help with, and this is going back to um, my experience as, as a classroom teacher, what we often need help with is our background knowledge. Okay? I, I programmed as a kid, I did bits as I was growing up, I did a computer science degree where I did bits of Java, but it was more systems kind of based. I haven't done programming you know, for a long time. And so my knowledge is, is rusty, so having that, that support, and some people don't have that background at all, they need more support. Um, they're not, maybe, they, they maybe need some help with exploring possibilities, knowing what is out there that can help them. So they want to solve a particular problem, or they wonder if, oh, can I do this with code? You guys, the developers, you're the people to ask. Um, relevance. You know, a lot of the sort of teaching materials that were out there, first of all, for teaching computer science was, right, well, here we're going to do a little maths game where you guess the number and we're going to use some selection to see if you're right or wrong. Or here's a, to a teacher tool to, we're going to write a piece of code which if you put in a score, it's going to tell you what your grade was. Which students are going to care about that? They're not. It's not particularly relevant to them. But developers, you're out there writing software, doing all kinds of cool things on things that kids might be aware of, whether it's robotics or web interfaces or whatever. You've got relevant experience that you know, can show kids cool things. Um, and also challenging pupils. The 16-year-old that I had that was a far better program than I, you know, talking to developers means that I can find ways of extending them, pushing them forward, and finding new ways to challenge them. And um, enabling learners. So this kind of comes down to the barriers point that we talked about a little bit earlier on. As a teacher, there's lots of little frustrations that we have, either to do with you know, network administration, the interface we're using, the libraries. Those problems, you know, it's good for us to be able to air those somewhere and have those conversations. 
and developers. So you guys are great at creating solutions. It's what you do. You know, here's a problem, create a solution to solve that. Okay? You've got the really in-depth, detailed knowledge about how the libraries work, how they interconnect, how we can use them. Um, you're great at writing libraries and tools that teachers can take into their classroom. And as I mentioned, you've also got that relevance, that experience which is current, which is relevant, which is sort of real world um, stuff. But perhaps what we can help with as teachers is finding new ways to engage learners. So that idea that you have about how, you know, you know this cool thing that we could do, you know, we, we can maybe work out how to make that more engaging for learners. And making Python more accessible. Um, the, the reason I chose Python, I, and, and, um, for its simplicity and its accessibility, I think that Python should be almost the de facto language, the text-based language that kids are using. And in the UK, it kind of is. You know, lots of kids in the UK, lots of teachers in the UK have chosen Python based on other teachers' recommendations. Whereas in the, in the States, we went over there recently, and it's, you know, Python is, is used a little bit in education, but not as much as C and Java and processing and, and JavaScript, which I find weird because they're just so syntax heavy. So that's how, um, what I think uh, the those two groups bring to it. So the teachers, we kind of help sort of sort that progression, the bit I was talking about from the learning experience early on, the progression of how we get from A to B. Developers, you're great at bringing the, the purpose, the, the projects, those kind of things. But the bit that's missing is the playfulness. And that's where day two comes in. So day two was the bit that I missed. And this was, the, I saw pictures the next day of all the stuff that was going on. And I really wished I could have been there rather than knocking down a wall or whatever. So I just, I nicked some pictures from Nick's presentation. But it just kind of shows the journey that kids go through. Okay, so here's, here's some kids sitting down at a computer. They're doing some coding. I've got, I've got no idea what it is they're doing. But they're doing some, some Python. It might be Minecraft. It might be, you know, Jeepo, whatever. And you can see there's this look of anxiety maybe in a couple you know, they're a bit unsure there's one hand on the keyboard there's a few little things we can notice there a few minutes later everyone's trying to get hold of the keyboard the mouse they're all having a go and this comes back to the point that um, Carrie mentioned her keynote that kids are inherently sort of investigative and playful and, and want to learn okay and they probably, I mean, there, there is a whole series, there's like 10 photos in this series, and they go through a range of emotions, like every human emotion you can almost imagine. You know, there's despair when it doesn't work, and all kinds of things going on. But then we get this moment at the end, where they've solved that problem, they've, hit all, they've got through all those little barriers, they've worked out what the problem is, they've solved it, and the look of satisfaction on their face is fantastic. Okay? And that's why we should be getting together as, education, as educationalists and developers to support these guys, okay, to make sure that they're having this experience with coding. That they very quickly, they don't hit that point, the first picture, and stop, but they're able to get to this point where they see the value, they get the gratification from coding. I've got no idea how I'm doing for time, so I'm, just, I'm, I'm probably running a little bit short, so I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll move on, but anyway. So uh, what's in it for, for um, the different groups? So first of all, it's fun, okay? Whether you're a teacher, a developer, or a, a kid coming to uh, a Python education event, it's tremendous fun, huge fun. Um, we've got a picture up here, and the first picture, you can't really see it, uh, one of the teachers that was on the, on the course, Sway, this was one of her tweets shortly afterwards, she tweeted, oh, I've just written something in, mi in Minecraft, I'm having so much fun, yay. Okay, here are some developers who are helping us out on the day. Um, again, smiling developers, having fun, enjoying themselves. Okay, doing something playful and creative. Um, and here we've got the kids just in awe, probably of Ben, I'm not sure what was going on there. Um, were you talking at that point? I'm not sure. Um, so the teachers, what they get is they get coaching, support, confidence building, and that's really important. So many teachers did not have the background that I had playing with code at a young age and having a little bit of experience of it. And that confidence is really important for them. They get ideas for lessons. They collaborate with other teachers. They collaborate with you guys. They collaborate with the kids, which, in fairness, is actually where some of these ideas should be coming from, okay? Because I don't want to teach kids how to do something that I want to do, because that's my passion, not theirs. I want them to be leading things. So actually getting together with the kids, they come up with a good idea, you're like, awesome, let's make that happen, right? Um, so we might get some new tools or, or contacts out of that, building on networks. Developers, you get to adopt a teacher, right? 
which, which is awesome. So um, I had this experience. I sat down with some developers, and my project wasn't particularly to do with uh, a scheme of work or a, a learning issue. It was more to do with enabling my use of GitHub in the classroom. So I sat down with some, uh, some developers and I said, what I want is I want to be able to push things to GitHub but it be private. I want like a local kind of GitHub. We found GitLab, which we played around with a little bit. And then what I want is I want like an automatic backup mechanism from my pies. So it pushes there and then I've just got a, you know, a repository that I can comment on and, and collaborate with the kids for. And we started some excellent discussions. We played around with some ideas. They kind of adopted me for the day. And unfortunately, shortly after PyCon, that kind of contact, that, uh, those conversations very soon uh, disappeared. Now, you know, it's perfectly understandable. Developers have day jobs. I'm a teacher. I'm back in the classroom, you know, and, and doing things. So it's, it's, it's difficult. But if you are going to do this, adopting a te teacher, it's really fantastic if you can maintain that relationship because it is, it is really beneficial to both. And I'll explain why both in just a second. So um, you get to engage teachers and kids with the Python community, which is a fantastic community, and we need to get the teachers and kids engaged within that. You get that warm, fuzzy feeling, right, which is, which is great. But also this point, um, it reinforces, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing um, Nick Tolliver here a little bit, um, it reinforces a deeper understanding of your own clarity of thought. Okay, So just to unpick that a little bit, when I was a maths teacher, and I said to a kid, right, well, um, I don't know, this, here's this mathematical concept. And the kid would say, well, why? Why is that the case? And I go, well, it is. It, because, because, it is. I don't know how to break that down any further. And that was me at the beginning of my teaching career. Not being able to understand that some things aren't self-evident. Okay? At that point, my knowledge of mathematics was not deep enough that I could explain that concept to a child. Okay? So being able to explain things to people that are non-experts, being able to unpick why things are, to you, maybe self-evident, actually gives you a deeper understanding, okay? And gives you a, a, a better clarity of thought. And the kids, what the kids get is they get a safe place to play and learn, okay? There's no measuring their progress, there's no sort of feeding back on what they're doing apart from in a positive way. Oh, that didn't work, brilliant, try this, have a go, okay? So they're supported, they're encouraged, and so on. They get to collaborate with others, and that's teachers, that's kids. Lots of kids don't get a chance to collaborate with adults. So that's fantastic. Lots of kids don't get a chance to collaborate with other groups of kids. So bringing them all together on this kind of day means they get that opportunity. And they get that sense of pride and achievement. I found a photo last night, but I couldn't put it back up here. There's a picture of, of Nick standing at the front with a kid and a robot. And the kid is just beaming because he's sharing his robot, robotic creation with an audience. So they get that sense of, you know, I have achieved something, I have done something, I am part of something. And that's, again, really powerful for kids. And did I mention the cake? Because that, that, was, that was great, okay? So um, this just, I'm gonna just take a brief pause. This is um, another perspective. This was a teacher um, that I'd, um, I'd met on Twitter. I met for the first time at PyCon, sat down, caught up, chatted with her. Um, she sent me this, because this was her point of view. So I'm, I'm going to shut up for a second and just give you a chance to read what her, how her thoughts were. And I think there's a couple of points in there. Um, sorry if you're still reading on part, I'm gonna just move on a little bit. A um, couple of points in here. You know, she regards herself as a relatively knowledgeable computing teacher, but really um, needs that support or, or values that support from developers. Um, and what her kids need is something exciting which will inspire them. And teachers don't have a huge amount of time. Okay, we, you know, the, the working week is very long. And um, so anything that developers can do or other people within the community to say, here's this really cool thing, by the way. Like I went on a camp conference and I was shown, here's a library that you can use, which if you just run a command, it will, I mean, was it? It, would, it would access the tube times, right? Which is, it's not super exciting, but it's way more exciting than like just crunching a few numbers arbitrarily in, in a fairly trite example. So this is really, um, really powerful. And there's a, there's a link there. 
Clay wrote a whole blog post all about the, uh, her experiences of, of PyCon. I recommend that if you're interested, you, you check that out. Um, there we go. Um, so how can you help? And again, I will be reiterating a few points um, from Carrie Ann's talk earlier on. So firstly, the adopter teacher, right? And that doesn't have to be through a PyCon event or any kind of physical face-to-face -face meetup. In your local area, wherever you are, find out what your teachers are doing in terms of computing, uh, programming, that kind of side of the curriculum. Find out if you can support them. Will, can you go in and, I don't know, I think my next point is talk about computing in your local school. Go and talk about the fun bits about you know, your day job. Right? Go and explain the cool things that you do with code and how it empowers you and what you, you, know, what you love about it. Um, help develop tools and libraries that support learners. And again, we, we've got, that, you know, well, you, you've got, you've, you've got the homework that, that carry on set, and so you know, we should all be working on that. Okay. Um, um, run a workshop or a talk for educators. And again, that could be at an event like PyCon. It could be at a local networking meeting. It could be that you, if you run like a local Python interest group type thing, you know, invite some teachers, get them to come along and find out what Python's all about. Have they got questions about Python and how to use it in their classroom? Um, Code Club, I don't know if um, how many people are aware of Code Club or, or, or how you access them, but Code Club uh, is a great uh, resource. It enables kind of a, a partnering scheme for getting uh, experts to go into schools, work with kids, run sort of uh, workshops. Uh, and that's great because it means that the teacher doesn't have to. They can attend and, and support you, but they don't have to be providing all the materials. Um, they get, you get a chance to network. It gives you an in. If, you know, sometimes it can be difficult from the outside to get uh, in with a school. Going via something like a code club might be the way to do that. And you know, there's probably a whole ton of things that we've not thought of, right? amazing things that you could do to help engage kids and teachers, A, with the Python community and with the language itself. Um, so if you've got any other cool ideas, come and find um, anyone from um, Raspberry Pi education team, come and chat with us. If you've got a, a, you know, an idea about something you'd like to do, then, then we're, we're happy to have that conversation. Um, and then I've just I've left some time for questions. So there we go. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was very uh, I liked uh, the kids day thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how old the kids were? I'm going to have to defer to Nick, who was organising. What was the range of the kids there, Nick? And I think that's important uh, as well, that it's not limited on age, um, because it means that the older kids can, can mentor the younger kids, and the, all the younger kids can mentor the older kids. Um, and, and there's lots of great opportunities for those, that collaboration. Nick, Don, you can... Yeah, sorry, I've got my hand up. I feel like I'm a child at a <laughs> primary school. So those photos of the children that we saw programming um, in the series of... The, the, the longer series of photos, actually, um, the kid in the middle at the... Uh, in the last one, um, he came along and, and mentored the other two. So they had a problem. He came along. There's a picture of him pointing at the screen, and then something goes wrong. And then all together, they they put it right. So the other important thing about this slide is that there are no adults involved in this learning as well. This is autonomous. You know, kids picking it up themselves. I think that's an important point as well. Is as as adults knowing when to step in. Um, so in, in a classroom, I would often encourage the kids to sort of, you know, make their, their first few steps by themselves and only come, you know, ask me for help when they, when they you know, ha hit three or four problems uh, because otherwise they feel they have to defer to that adult. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, James. Thank you.